Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we're studying John chapter 12. We'll begin in verse 1. But before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 12, verse 1, begins the story of the anointing of Jesus by Mary. This is the Mary that we've already been introduced to. Sister is Martha, brother is Lazarus. Now this story that goes on in the beginning of chapter 12 of John is also in Matthew 26, 6-13, and Mark 14, 3-9. So if we want to add a little detail there, we can go over and look at those books. Uh, Luke doesn't write about this particular account. But John and Matthew and Mark do. And we'll bring in some of Matthew and Mark later on. Now the introduction to this section, the setting, is verse 1. John writes, Then Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. It's six days before the Passover. This would make it Saturday evening. Remember that Jesus had been up north in Ephraim, if you remember our last couple of lessons. Uh, that's up north from Jerusalem down here. Ephraim up here. Bethany back down by Jerusalem, less than two miles. Now, Bethany, as you remember, is the home of Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, who Jesus has recently raised from the dead. Now, John tells us that it's six days before the Passover. Now, let's understand. Six days before the Passover. This is Saturday evening, the time that this dinner is going to take place, this anointing during the dinner. The next Saturday evening, Jesus would be in the grave. All right? So we're just a week away from his crucifixion. Saturday evening at 6 p.m. in the Jewish way of counting their days is when the Sabbath begins. Begins the Sabbath. Their days went from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. Remember, ours go from 12 midnight to 12 midnight. So it gets a little confusing. So let's understand, though it's Saturday evening, the Sabbath begins at 6 p.m. So, if they're eating dinner past 6, then they're eating it during the Sabbath. Now, the fact that the Passover is coming, all right, it's not far away. This is one of the major feasts. Helps us prepare for the rest of the week because some big things are going to happen during this week. This is the last week that Jesus will be in his mortal body before his resurrection on this Sunday. Okay? Put a big R right there for his resurrection. So we're getting ready to study the last week before Jesus is put on the cross. So what do they do? Jesus returns to Bethany. Now, no one understands except Jesus that he's going to the cross by next weekend. But he gives lots of hints, drops lots of clues, and we might keep that in mind as we approach that time and some of the things that's going to happen here during this dinner. All right? 
So there's going to be a dinner. And Bethany, Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus are there. And Mary is going to anoint Jesus. Verse 2 tells us about the dinner or the supper. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. So Jesus is there with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they're having dinner. It says, so they made him supper. It doesn't tell us who they are. We would assume that Mary and Martha are involved. But there could be a number of people involved in that because this is a pretty big meal with a lot of people there. Again, we're told the village is Bethany. But we're not told whose house the banquet is in. Now, you might think, well, it's probably going to be in Mary and Martha's. That's where they were earlier. No. Matthew 26, 6 and Mark 14, 3 and their account of this same event has them at the house of Simon the leper. Now, we don't hear much about Simon the leper, except this is what they called him, and we would assume that Simon caught leprosy. But some think that Simon the leper, leper might have been the father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So they'd basically be in the same house that they were earlier. But we don't know the answer on that for sure, whether Simon the leper was their father or not. So we just have to kind of think, well, maybe, maybe not, and leave it at that, because the Bible doesn't tell us. We learn in our verse that Martha was serving. She's serving the guest. And Lazarus was one of those there with Jesus, reclining with him. <clears throat> now, when we eat, we usually sit at a table. I don't know about you, but uh, in the western part of the world, most of us sit at a table. But back in those days, now this may sound kind of strange, they actually had a table that was on the floor. Then they have kind of a couch, or you might say a big cushion, to lean on. And they would lean on one arm and eat with their free arm at the table, with their head and hands at the table and their feet would kind of lay out away from the table. That was the custom. So with the feet laying away from the table, as you might picture it, it would make it easy for Martha to get to Jesus' feet because they weren't like under a table or hard to get to, okay? Then we see in verse 3 that Mary does something quite astounding. Listen to this. Then Mary took a pound of very pure nard ointment, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Let's talk about this ointment a minute. We see the word pound. That's actually the uh, Greek word pound, but refers to the Roman pound, which would be about 12 ounces. In liquid, that would be about a pint or half a liter. Uh, we like to buy uh, Coke and stuff in two-liter bottles. That's two liters, all right? So we're talking about a fourth of one of those. That's a lot of liquid, all right? And it's called a very pure nard ointment. The word pure is related to the word faith, but people... Scholars think that it has to do with the purity of the liquid. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. It's also called nard. I'm going to put that up there on the board. Uh, nard. You've probably never heard of that word before. It's a oil from India. It comes from its root or its spike. So sometimes it's called spike nard. As you see, it's a fragrant smelling oil from the root or spike of the nard plant from northern India. So no, not only did this uh, fragrant ointment come from a long distance, but we learn it's very expensive. Even a little bit's expensive. And Mary had a whole pint. All right? It's called ointment. Uh, 
the word for ointment you might be interested in is moron or muron I should say muron it's the word we get the word mir from or myrrh you often hear about myrrh during Christmas time and that was one of the gifts to Jesus as a baby it's a sweet smelling oil or perfume so Mary has this pound of very pure nard ointment now we learn about the cost of this nard and how expensive it is by what uh, John not John but uh, Judas says later on it's worth a year's wages so it's expensive Mark tells us she broke the vial probably meaning the seal but Matthew and Mark both tell us that Mary poured it on Jesus' head it doesn't mention his feet so what we have is two of the Gospels say they poured it on his head John says they poured it on their feet so how do we make these two match? Well, it's really simple. Matthew and Mark see the head anointing as the most important part. And what probably happened is that Mary first poured it on Jesus' head and then went down to his feet. Now, why does Matthew and Mark mention just the head? Well, maybe that's all they could really see is when she poured on his head. And they were at a different angle. They couldn't see the feet, but... Regardless, when you anoint someone in the head, if you remember in the Old Testament, that usually had to do with anointing a king or prophet. So you might have a prophet come up and anoint a king. Or a prophet might anoint someone else at a significant position, perhaps a prophet. And what we have here is a picture of Jesus being anointed as king and we know he's a king we also know he's a prophet but John emphasizes that his feet was anointed now what do the feet do they take you to where you're going don't they of course and anointing the feet was a was not a very respectable job you might say that was usually the duty of a slave one of the lowest of the slaves in the household so basically, she went from head to Jesus' feet and anointing him. The feet also uh, takes us to where we're going to go. Where was Jesus headed by the end of the week? The cross. So you can see some of the significant symbolism of all this anointing. All right. Jesus is king. Jesus has already shown himself to be the prophet. And he's on his way to the cross. Now, when she pours this uh, jar of ointment on Jesus, she's quite generous with it. I mean, she pours it all on him. Uh, this would be an extravagant use of the oil. A lot of it is expensive. And she pours all of it on Jesus without hesitation. So, what does she do next? After she pours it on his feet, she lets down her hair. Now, the women usually have their hair up under uh, some sort of covering. But she let her hair down. And she began to dry Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, the things that's unusual about this is that the women usually didn't take the hair down except in front of their husbands. But this was an exceptional time and an exceptional act and not only that, she wiped his feet with her hair. So I expect it was kind of long, don't you? To be able to wipe somebody, you'd have to be able to reach down there. And there she was, wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. And another thing, with all this oil poured out and spread around on Jesus, the house was filled with the fragrance of the anointment. Now, why did Mary do this besides what we just saw in the symbolism? She probably didn't think about the idea that this was 
the king and going to the cross, but we who know the scripture understand symbolism and why these things happen and what else they communicate. But Mary was showing Jesus an act of devotion. Uh, Mary very much loved Jesus. She understood who he was uh, to some degree and wanted to show how devoted she was to the Lord. The other thing is, remember I said, if we go back a page or two, this is the beginning of what we call the Passion Week. This does become a popular term the last week of Jesus' life he's going to be arrested and tried and crucified all right so the passion week has started what Jesus has said his hour remember or his time it has begun a week from now his body would be in the tomb so this uh, anointing of Jesus anticipates all the things that are coming up. Now, John, our author, decides to tell us what Judas said. Judas speaks up. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, intending to betray Jesus, Judas is getting ready to speak up. But let's understand, this was a lot of expensive perfume used on one person all at one time. This got the other disciples' attention also. And they were also thinking, according to Matthew and Mark, that this was an extravagant use. Now, extravagant in this way could be say it's a waste. Too much of it was used. Has anyone ever said that you did too much of something, like use too much water uh, in the bathtub or in the shower or doing something else? Well, this is an extravagant use of the perfume. And the other disciples realized that too. But Mary had a purpose for it. And Judas Iscariot brings this up, that that was an extravagant use. Listen to what he says in verse 5. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Well, this is where we get the idea that it was expensive. Now listen, follow this. Put on your math hat for a moment. Denarii, a denarii was a silver coin worth a day's wages. So, if you take a year, with some 360 days or so, depending on how you were on Jewish time or our time, minus 50 Sabbaths, okay, or 50, 52 Sundays, as some might want to call it, but it's actually 50 Sabbaths. That leaves you about 300 days, right? This is where we get a year's wages. 300 denarii was like 300 one day's wages and depending on well maybe where you live whether you live in Europe or Africa uh, you can figure out that no matter how you look at it this was really expensive perfume the average wage over the United States I think somewhere between thirty to forty thousand dollars for one person who works so you're talking about thirty thousand dollars worth of perfume Thirty thousand uh, dollars. That would buy you a really nice car in the United States, or pickup. Now, we know about Judas, right? John is writing this, knowing what Judas is going to do, because right, he's looking back at the story and writing about it. But when he speaks about wanting to give the money to the poor. We, they couldn't read Judas's heart, but John tells us, looking backwards, his motives. Look at verse 6 and tells us what Judas really had in mind. It wasn't concern for the poor. It was something else. Verse 6. 
Now Judas said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief holding the money box, or actually he was the keeper of it. That's the idea. He was the treasurer. Holding the money box, he used to steal what was in it. Here we get a good idea what Judas was really like. He was greedy. He was a thief. He really had no concern about the poor, but he was thinking, boy, if we could have sold this and gotten $30,000, just think, I could probably take five or ten thousand. No one really notice it. Now, why would they have a treasurer like Judas? Well, the disciples didn't know he was a thief. But they would have a treasurer to keep their money, which they would draw from when they needed uh, something to perhaps to eat or pay for somewhere to stay. But this would take care of uh, Jesus and the disciples' needs as they traveled along. And if you Someone wanted to give to the group, they'd give it over to Judas, he'd put it in the money box. But Judas had been taking money out. Now, where he got to spend it and when he got to spend it, we're not told. But he was probably hiding it somewhere and then spending it when he got a chance. But the reason he wants to sell the perfume, or says it such a way, is because he's thinking about what he could have got out of the money box, you see. Well, that was... John describing what Judas was thinking. But let's go back to the scene where Mary is pouring the ointment on Jesus and this comment about it being not a good use of it. Jesus responds. So Jesus said, let her alone. She has she has kept it, I should have put kept it for the day of my burial. Now what this is telling us is is that Jesus is anticipating being buried in a few days. He tells Judas and others just leave her alone. Uh, Matthew and Mark we go to their story they tell us that Jesus said this is also a good deed done to him. Matthew 26 10 and Mark 14 6 and then he says, she has kept it for the day of my burial. So what's going on here? And Mary didn't know this either. But Jesus is telling the people there at this dinner that what she's doing is preparing me for burial. Now this is insight from Jesus. He knows what's going to happen. And he allows it to happen. I wonder what Mary must have thought after she heard this. That Jesus is going to die? Or does she just think that, well, in the future he's going to die. We don't know when. Everyone's going to die, right? But Jesus points out it's for his burial. And this anticipates for us, as we know, that in a week away he's going to be buried. Then Jesus says, verse 8, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Let's look at the first line first. For you always have the poor with you. This is Jesus giving the reason to leave her alone and let her do the anointment. It wasn't that the poor wasn't going to be there. And this isn't Jesus saying that we don't care for the poor. But it does tell us in the second line, but you, but you do not always have me, is that now is the time to do something for Jesus because he's going to be leaving. Poor will still be here, even after Jesus is gone. So Jesus isn't ignoring the poor, or what we might say, being indifferent towards them. But there will be many opportunities to help the poor in the future. But for right now, and Jesus tells them, you do not always have me. And as I've already said, and you know by now, in a week's time, Jesus will be crucified and buried. Now, of course, he'll resurrect. But as far as being 
Jesus in his mortal body. Now, that's the body that you and I are in right now. It's going to die unless the Lord comes back first. In his mortal body, time is running out. Right? Because in a week's time, let's go back to our little timetable here. Let's fill this in a little bit. All right? You have Saturday, Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. All right? By Friday night, He's going to be buried. All right? He's in the grave. He's in the grave. He's in the grave a little bit Sunday morning, and then he raises up on a Sunday morning, so we put the resurrection here. Okay? Comes up on Sunday morning. So we're getting very close to that time. At that time, Jesus will be in his resurrection body. His eternal body, his body that is ready to go for all eternity. So again, the opportunity for anyone to do anything like Mary, well, the time's almost up. Now, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, 40 days later, so I can get it all in here, he will go on up to be in heaven and sit down at the right hand of the Father. But still, as far as being his mortal body, that time is running out. That's the idea. So Mary is showing an extreme act of devotion to Jesus. And where she got this um, perfume, perfume, this ointment, this perfumed ointment, uh, either they had a lot of money, or maybe someone had uh, given it to them as an inheritance, you know, just to save it as something that you save that's expensive or in the family. But whatever the case, she spent it on Jesus, beginning the last week of his life. And this is in great contrast to Judas, who's selfish, who's greedy, and who will betray Jesus. Well... We go on to the next act of our story. And we see people coming out to see Jesus once they learn he's in the area. Now remember, Jesus is now back in Bethany near Jerusalem. And what's going on in Jerusalem? People are preparing for one of the largest festivals of the year, the Passover. Now, during the Passover, Jews would come in from all around Israel, maybe even further out in the Roman Empire at that time. And so the population of Jerusalem would swell tremendously, maybe from a few thousand to tens of thousands would start coming in for this celebration festival. And word got around that Jesus was out in Bethany. So what happens? Verse 9. We see the reactions to Jesus' presence at Bethany. Verse 9. The large crowd of the Jews learned that he was there. And they came not on account of Jesus only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So this large crowd comes out of Jews or people from Judea, that area. They came out to see both Jesus and Lazarus. And it appears that Lazarus is quite the celebrity at this time. Uh, not many people can talk about being in the tomb and then being raised from the dead by Jesus. No one except Lazarus that we have a record of. But Lazarus apparently had been hidden from the public, probably by his sisters, just to keep the attention away from him, give him some privacy. But now he comes out, and you can understand that when Jesus shows up. Well, 
people want to see those two. And then the authorities hear about this, as we might imagine. John gives us a comment about what the authorities were thinking now that Jesus and Lazarus are together. Look at verses 10 and 11. And the chief priest planned that they might put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away from them, that is, the authorities, and were believing in him, that is, Jesus. Well, let's summarize these two verses. The chief priest, that's the Jewish authorities, some of them who were in the Sanhedrin, that council, added Lazarus to the hit list. The hit list being people they wanted killed. And as long as Lazarus was alive, Lazarus was a living testimony to the power and person of Jesus. After all, Jesus had raised him from the dead. And then we see that because of him, many of the Jews were going away from them. Because of Lazarus, Lazarus was there too. People say, he's the one that was raised from the dead? And there are probably people who knew Lazarus and people who knew people who knew Lazarus, okay, and what had happened. So people were leaving the belief of the Jewish authorities. And that's what it means when it says they were going away from them and they were turning to Jesus by believing in him. So Lazarus being alive and being there is bad enough. If it was bad enough for them that Jesus was back. Now Lazarus is here too, the one they raised from the dead, the one that was in the tomb. And there were enough witnesses to be very convincing that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And once that word got around and they see that Jesus and Lazarus are together again, well, I just wonder if they thought Jesus was going to do something else miraculous. Well, the Jewish authorities didn't like them being around, not even alive, in fact. And now they want to get rid of Lazarus also. Now, though they placed Lazarus on this list of those to be killed, uh, nothing seems to have ever come out of it since there's no mention of it later in Scripture. This is one of those things where you'd want some sort of closure if there was. So I think we can assume that Lazarus died a, a natural death later on. No mention of how he actually died. Now, I want us to look at something. I drew this a while ago, but I want us to look at it from a different angle. Because it's so long, I have to do it from top to bottom, not side to side. So this is a timeline, but not the kind I usually give you. Let's study it for a moment. Sunday a.m. Now, the dinner... The supper, we just saw the ointment being poured out on Jesus' feet, is the evening before this Sunday. Got it? So what comes before Sunday? We call it Saturday, right? So that Saturday evening, which we saw on the other timeline, we lead it up to the next day. The next day, we have what is popularly called the triumphal entry. Now, we'll get into that. Uh, that's what happens next in the series of events. But I want you to see, by Friday, we have the crucifixion. The crucifixion starts 9 a.m. in the morning. Stops at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on Friday. And they get Jesus ready for burial so that he's in the grave before the Sabbath begins, which begins Saturday, excuse me, our Friday night at 6 o'clock. All right? So, that's important to understand, 6 p.m. I know it gets confusing, but understand, Jesus was crucified, started Friday morning at 9, ended 3 p.m. They got him ready for burial before and buried him before the Sabbath started because they didn't want burying people done on the Sabbath. So Jesus is in the grave 
by the evening of the Sabbath. That counts as the first day, by the way. A part of the day would count as the first day. Second day, Saturday. Third day would be Sunday. Well, that gives you an idea. And maybe we can fill in some times here as we move along. But you understand we're only about a week away from the crucifixion. Now, the next day, we have an event called the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now remember, where is he at? He's in Bethany. He's going to go into Jerusalem. And it's going to be quite a scene. We're a week before the Passover. So let's begin to look at this. There's an awful lot of information here, and a lot of it's important. So we're going to work our way through it. Verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast, that is, the feast of Passover, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So now we have another crowd. Remember, there's a crowd out there that went to see Jesus and Lazarus. Now there's another crowd in Jerusalem. And word spread that Jesus was in the area. And they expected him to come into Jerusalem, which he's going to do. And they're going to go out as a crowd to meet him. All right? So there's a crowd inside Jerusalem that's going to meet Jesus when he comes into town. There's a crowd with Jesus, with his disciples, when he comes into town. So they're going to all meet up as Jesus comes into town. Now let's look at the order of events here, because when John starts to describe this, it's not quite the order of when things happen, because some of them appear to have happened at the same time. So let's just get a short list of order of events. All right, here they are. Jesus plans to go to Jerusalem. That's just to say that he is intending to go to Jerusalem. Two, he sends out two of his disciples to get a donkey colt. This is a, a foal of a, of a, of a, uh, a donkey. He's, he's a small colt. All right? And we'll discuss the significance of Jesus riding in on a colt when we get there. Three, they retrieve the donkey colt for him. Four, he mounts it and then enters the city. And as he enters the city, point five, we have the crowds with the palm branches and the shouting that's going to go on. Now, traditionally, we call this Palm Sunday. Obviously, we get the name of it from the fact that they use these palm branches. We're going to talk about them, too. So, let's understand that Jesus is going to come into town. The people are going to celebrate his entrance with palm branches. Jesus could be riding on a donkey coat, a little donkey. And the crowds are going to start shouting. Now, let's go to the next verse, which describes the palm branches and what they're going to do with them. They took the branches of the palm trees. These branches came from palm trees. There were there are different types of palm trees in the world. Uh, you may be familiar with palm trees out on the islands that we often associate that grow uh, coconuts, right? These palm trees actually are probably date palms. They grew dates, in which people would draw and you could eat the dates. Anyway, they took these branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and kept shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now this verse is loaded with information. It has information from the Old Testament and some new information. And we need to look at this, the description of what's going on with the branches of the palm trees. Let me show you a picture of the palm branches they probably use. Now this is a modern day picture where people would do this as a tradition. They look something like this. Isn't it interesting they call them palm trees? Uh, do you know why they call them palm trees? Look at the branches. Uh, the Latin is palma. P-A-L-M-A. -A. That's the palm of the hand. So, 
the leaves look like fingers extending from the palm of the hand. So the waving of the palm branches would be like having a big hand waving during the time that Jesus came in. Have you ever seen at football games or some other game where they had those big old gloves that are like ten times bigger than a hand? That's what it reminds me of. And they would usually point to where number one or something like that. Well, the idea is that these palm hands were just a way to celebrate uh, something that's happening. Now, from the Old Testament, it's taught that the palm, the waving of palm branches became a gesture, a movement, you know, a gesture, something you do with your hands or your feet or something. It's a gesture. It's an action of messianic hope. Now, what does this mean? Well, people hoped that Messiah would come. So during certain festivals, the one in the law is the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now you say, well, this isn't the Feast of the Tabernacles. No, it's not. It's the Feast of the Passover. But it was also adopted for the Passover. And it became a sign of their nationalism, a sign of their nation, a sign of their hope. So they like to do it during their big celebrations. Just like over the United States, we, we celebrate the New Year's with firecrackers and uh, often firework shows. But we also during, do that most of all during the 4th of July, a day of independence. That's the big shows. Then other people, they don't really have shows around New Year's, but they do pop firecrackers to welcome the New Year in. So these things, like waving of palms, extended to the Passover too. In fact, the palm, the palm itself, the palm leaf, uh, as I showed you, the branch, it became a national symbol. Uh, we have uh, olive uh, branches on some of our symbols, and people understand that usually represents peace. Well, they're palm branches. They even had it on their coins, too, by the way. It was a sign of their nationalism. Pride in their country, you might call it. So what would happen is, this crowd would take these branches of the palm trees, like we saw, and they went out to meet him. And they began to wave them, like they were welcoming him in. And you might picture it as kind of like a, what we call a gauntlet where the people were all in rows, like you'd have in a parade ground, right, on, on both sides of the path, right, and then start waving these palm branches, welcoming Jesus as he came into town. We're looking down on this, of course, okay? And went out to meet him. Now remember, what did the palm branch represent? I said it earlier, the messianic hope that their Messiah was coming. So when they start waving these with Jesus coming into town, what do you think they think? That Jesus is the Messiah. And why would they get so excited about this? Well, one of the reasons is because they believed that the Messiah would come and be a conqueror. You know what conquer means, to win a battle, to, to take over. They thought the Messiah would come as a conquering king and that he would, cook, would kick <laughs> the occupying armies of the Romans out of Israel. And this is why they're getting so excited. Now just think of it. Here you have Israel that is basically ruled by the Romans. The Romans let them have their religion. They let them have some of their own rulers. They let them have the, the council and the Jewish authorities. But they really didn't have their freedom as they wanted it. 
they wanted their country back and they wanted the Romans out. So the people are thinking, waving these branches, saying, Hosanna, that Jesus is the Messiah, the King who's going to come and free them and give them independence from Rome. Now we're told that they kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Hosanna, blessed is he who, and they would repeat this and repeat this and repeat this. Now where does this come from, Hosanna? Well, for that, we go back to the Old Testament, as we often do to get our interpretation. Hosanna basically means Lord save. It's from Psalm 118, 25a. Now let's talk about Psalm 118 for a moment because it's important for our background. If you've studied any of the Psalms in the children's series or just studied them with your parents, you know that some of the Psalms were called praise Psalms. They were Psalms that praise God. Right? They had a name in the Hebrew called Hallel. Four in a row are 113. Is it four in a row? 113 through 118. That's more than four, right? Actually, seven. Seven of them. 118. Twenty-five is what we're going to look at. Verse 25. Now they would sing these praise songs, but they took some of Psalm 118.25 and were quoting it or saying it here when Jesus entered. Let's look at Psalm 118.25. Keeping in mind that this was a praise psalm. Here it is. O oh Lord, please save us. O oh Lord, please grant us success. That's the idea of Hosanna, please save us. And what's interesting about this psalm is that it is what we call a deliverance psalm. A psalm where the people are thanking the Lord, praising him for delivering them. But here it sounds like he's, they're asking for his deliverance. Do you understand what I said? It's a deliverance psalm, praising God for already delivering them. But here they are in this psalm also asking God to, or the Lord to, save them or deliver them. So what's going on? That's part of the key of understanding this. Once the Messiah gets among them, once the Messiah comes, let's put it this way, they will be delivered, right? That's what they believe is going to happen. But when he's with them and they say, deliver us still, in the present tense, right? Deliver. They're saying, continue to take care of us. Continue to deliver us. Continue to save us. That's the idea. Now they're calling on Jesus to save them when they call this out, Hosanna. Save them. What are they talking about? Well, if you've listened carefully, they want Jesus to deliver them from the Romans. All right? Let's go back to our verse in John again, verse 13. Look at the next line. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now this is from Psalm 118, verse 26. Let me show it to you. It's right there. Same thing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And notice the next line. We have blessed you in the house of the Lord. They expect that Jesus is going to go into the house of the Lord as king and be blessed. That anticipates that. But what we're concerned about is the top line. 
Notice, they say that Jesus is coming in the name of the Lord. Interesting, isn't it? He is the Lord. But they're saying he's coming in the name of the Lord. So they haven't got it completely straight. But they call him, look at the next line, the bottom line of our verse, the last phrase, the king of Israel. So, let's go through these last two lines in this verse. Hosanna, save us, Lord save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They want this Jesus blessed. And then they say the king of Israel. They see him as the Messiah. But they really don't see him as the Lord God. So Jesus comes in, they're accepting him as their king, but their conquering king. That's what's going on. So the people in Christ's day, waving these palm leaves, shouting over and over, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. They are welcoming, welcoming their new king, Jesus, expecting him to lead them against the Romans. This is what we call messianic fervor at its height. The people are all whipped up and excited to get Jesus to, to go and start taking back their country from the Romans. Now, what they don't understand is that he is the king but not the type of king they want or accept. And when Jesus comes in like he will, or as he is when they are starting to wave those palms and chant this phrase, Jesus is going to show them by, their very, by his very entrance that he's not the conquering king right now. When Jesus comes in, he doesn't come in in battle gear, swinging a sword, riding on a war horse, but he's sitting in plain clothes up on a donkey coat. And what is Jesus doing? Now listen carefully. Jesus, I'm going to write it down, is presenting himself as Savior, as Savior Prince, we might say the Prince of Peace, not a conquering king, sitting on a donkey could be misunderstood by the crowd thinking that he's going to switch over to a war horse. And we see this because in the Old Testament, Solomon, son of David, in 1 Kings 1, and 38, Absalom, both of these were sitting on mules as princes. 2 Samuel 18, 9. So you have the princes the sons of David as princes setting on, setting on the mules. Horses weren't real common in those days in Israel, all right? So they'd ride donkeys or mules. And this was a princely ride when Jesus came in on a donkey. And it's a little donkey, not real little, but big enough to hold the weight of a man, all right? And they're pretty sturdy animals. But this wasn't a full-grown donkey. This was a small one. And the next couple of verses are going to tell us where Jesus got this donkey colt. So what we want to understand from this part of the lesson is that as Jesus is coming in and they're shouting, Hosanna, Lord save us. Blessed he is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They're thinking this is their conquering king. 
that it's time for them to take back Israel. Jesus is coming and he's going to present himself as the Prince of Peace, as the Savior Prince. Now, this entrance continues to be described in the next several verses, and we're going to see where Jesus got this donkey coat. All right? Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been fascinating to learn about Mary and anointing Jesus' feet and all the symbolism behind these things. And, and now we learn the important idea behind Jesus coming in on a donkey coat as the Prince of Peace. Lord, help us understand these things because they're so important for other things we're going to learn about our Lord and how we can best follow him. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen.